beginnt jetzt. Alle Teilnehmer befinden sich im Zuhörermodus. So, hello and good afternoon. I welcome you to today's weekly market outlook here together with Admiral Markets. My name is Jens Klett and I'll be the um, moderator here for the upcoming 45 minutes around. Um, we want, as usual, have a look at uh, the current developments in the in the markets. So, in fact, um, it's, uh, yeah, somehow it's, it's a, somehow a little difficult um, to, to draw a concrete picture because everything I'm uh, presenting here for the upcoming week is uh, potentially um, overruled um, overnight from today, Friday to, to Saturday, uh, because this is the time when uh, Xi Jinping, the Chinese Prime Minister, and Donald Trump, US President, will um, meet in, in Osaka in Japan. Um, and uh, one, one second, please. Uh, one second. Okay, perfect. So, um, and uh, any, yeah, any, any developments there, any, any um, um, hint that there will be a deal in the near term, or at least there will be, um, uh, there will be uh, um, um, ongoing negotiations between the U.S. and Chinese, uh, could could trigger some kind of risk on mode in the markets uh, with a start into the into the uh, next week of trading. On the other hand, any new escalation. Um, would potentially trigger risk of mode and potentially bring markets under pressure. So very difficult to right now say in which direction um, um, we will we will uh, see developments here. Nevertheless, we will try to to nevertheless draw a picture and give two ideas. Then uh, one for uh, trade talks um, resume, the other for uh, trade talks won't resume, um, and, and and then paint, paint a picture based on that. Um, yeah, before we start, nevertheless, very important, we have to have a look here at the risk disclaimer as usual. So trading with financial instruments offered by Atmar markets carry a high level of risk, which is not suitable for all investors due to their complex nature. And before entering into a client agreement or making a transaction, please make sure that you read the terms and conditions of the service from Atmar markets. Um, this was the first two sentences of the risk disclaimer. The full risk disclaimer can be viewed on the website from Admiral. Nevertheless, as usual, um, and since it's still a topic, we want to have a look here at the differentiation now taking place between retail clients and professional clients after the so-called ESMA decision. Um, the ESMA decision is uh, especially targeting um, leverage and uh, here bringing restrictions into play for retail clients with a max of 1 to 30 in Forex majors like EURUSD for example, 1 to 20 in other currency pairs, so-called miners, GBP Australian dollar for example, CAT JPY um, and also CFDs like DAX30 um, and um, also gold for example with a max leverage then here of 1 to 20. Um, the differentiation now between retail clients and professional clients is that professional clients or those who are categorized as professional clients are not um, falling under these leverage restrictions. Um, still, there's another big difference then, which is nevertheless um, here very interesting, targeted by Admiral Markets. So uh, usually retail clients facing these leverage restrictions, they also have a so-called unlimited protection against negative balances. In case of professional clients, um, there's three criteria which, which has to be um, met here to, to, to be classified as a professional client. Information's on the website from Admiral, and if you have questions on top of that feel free to reach out to the uh, support from Admiral Markets um, and then uh, yeah find out whether whether um, it, it's something which is of interest for you. In case of professional clients there's usually not such a negative balance protection so if you're an elective professional client then uh, you usually um, face uh, um, the, the risk of, of seeing your your account going to and um, below zero. In case of Admiral Markets you're protected up to 50,000 pounds sterling according to the policy um, which is definitely very interesting because that means if you meet the criteria for professional client, you're still protected up to 50,000 pounds sterling. Also here, all informations on that um, then uh, on the website respectively um, by asking the support. This is me, uh, the uh, face to the voice you're currently listening to. And um, one thing I'd like to mention here as usual is um, I'm located in Berlin in Germany. Admiral Markets, by the way, we'll see um, uh, here also uh, where 
the offices from Atmara are located. Um, they have also one um, office here in Berlin in, in Germany. And um, when we here in Germany, um, among traders especially, uh, talk about Admiral Markets, you, we usually refer to Admiral as a so-called DAX expert. Um, they are a licensed partner, for example, but also they have a very competitive offering when it comes to the cost of trading here um, with a typical spread of 0, 0.0. Uh, points during the main trading hours. What's also very interesting, especially for short-term traders, uh, is that um, they are offering with their so-called Admiral Prime um, um, offering a 0.2 spread and on top of that you pay a commission then. This is uh, noteworthy because it's very interesting for short-term traders, especially scalpers, um, who are looking for very, very tight spreads then. And um, yeah, that said, it's not only that the DAX is um, um, uh, very of, of high interest for traders, but also sure, um, FX markets, further information on, on the product, um, um, uh, details here can be found on the website. So yeah, One World Global Offers, it's something I already mentioned with several offices around the globe, Germany um, in, 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 uh, in the UK, then there's also an office for example in Chile, there's also an office here in Australia um, with those uh, regulatory bodies then um, also um, a, um, regulating in this case Admiral Markets here and um, also what this could mean if you're located here for your trading in regards to leverage and all this also please feel free to reach out to the website for further information there are the contact details and um, then as usual here our agenda I already mentioned what we want to look at G20 um, summit in Osaka in Japan what it could mean for markets but also we want to look at the upcoming week of stream because it's in fact very interesting um, it's probably not only the G20 summit which is of interest and which could level the path then or, or guide the direction for the upcoming months in fact at the financial markets not only um, for equity markets but also for currency markets um, like join Remimbi for example and in this regard um, uh, or again Again, want to mention those talks between uh, Xi Jinping and, and Donald Trump but uh, there are also some very important economic um, um, data being published next week we have the ISM manufacturing on Monday we have the ISM non manufacturing on Wednesday we have the non farm payrolls on Friday we have ADP data also already on Wednesday um, and now the interesting thing about this is uh, on Tuesday, I'm sorry, not Tuesday, Thursday, there is the 4th of July, so-called Independence Day in the US. It's a bank holiday. So what you usually expect, um, not only on this day itself, where we have shortened trading hours, but also already on Wednesday, you expect um, a liquidity to dry out. So we have two shortened trading days in the next week, potential drop in liquidity. Then we have the G20 decision, which markets have to um, 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 interpret and, and then um, find a direction based on. And then we have those economic events. So based on that, there's potentially volatility ahead of us and uh, in fact very interesting also based on several comments made now after the Fed decision last week on Wednesday from James Bullard on um, Tuesday in a Bloomberg interview also something we like to mention which is um, all in all painting a clear picture midterm picture in my opinion uh, when it comes to gold even though it was an between the lines hawkish statement than initially thought but still it, it, it draws a clear picture of what to expect from the Fed and for the US dollar uh, and in regards to strength and um, uh, or respectively weakness um, and, and the fundamental outlook. Sure, then we want to um, have a look at the current bias and FX equity and commodity markets and then we want to answer the, um, the question which trading opportunities may arise. So we want to, to draw um, um, uh, an overall global macro picture. There's a currency pair which we want to look at at the end of the webinar. Um, very, very exotic, but still, we are entering a very interesting period here of, uh, of the year in Euro uh, Polish Sloty. <laughs> I've never traded it myself, by the way, but I'd like to, to mention it here since it seems to be very, very interesting. Um, the upcoming days here within this, this time frame, we have an 82% chance over the last 20, 25 years that um, the currency pair will drop, in fact. But we look at this in a, um, um, at the end of the webinar. Before we start with the global economy, Economic outlook with the macro outlook I'd like to uh, here first of all point to the developments currently taking place in the DAX um, uh, in regards to, to the DAX 
we can already see here that we are very close trading in the region around the uh, current yearly highs. This is in fact the overall target probably also into the weekly close. And the thing is, let's have a look here at the five minute chart first. What do we see? Um, are we, I'm sorry, by the way, let me just see. Do we have a five minute here? No. Okay, so this is the DAX on five minute. Um, probably I'd, I'd, I'd have to, I have to, to, to enter it here to make sure that everyone is on the same page, even if he is now looking at this webinar a little later. So, so it's uh, DAX 30 CFD on a five minute time frame. Um, so very, very micro um, on what we are looking at here. But from an interview perspective, highly interesting because we can see that the market obviously is not building any pressure. After seeing a push here towards a crucial region, we'll see that on an hourly chart in a few minutes, 12,330 to 12,350. So this is the region we are currently attacking. We are holding above this blue line. This is my uh, trend filter. So in fact, when I look at the, uh, at the DAX, I try to not overcomplicate things and I found out over the years that uh, on a five minute time frame the DAX very often respects as a, a dynamic support and resistance line over the day, intraday, um, this EMA 50 um, for whatever reason but it just does. It, as you can see here um, we, we found support several times today and we're not breaking below that. Same is true for example yesterday, let me just here show this. So, and this is just two days. You can see it here. That's the start into the day. The market trends higher, and then we we find support here. And rather sooner or later, it breaks as usual, as a support or a resistance line will break. But still, um, it, it it found support several times. And here, yesterday, when this drop occurred, I think most likely was due to an uh, imbalance in the order book or something. Um, nevertheless, it's it's a clear sign that now the advantage is not on the long side anymore, and could then also act as a first sign to scale out slash take out long positions in the market. So, um, and you can see this um, 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 into the past for quite a while. And uh, so what happens today is very interesting because we're now drifting higher. The market is obviously not getting that much resistance on the upside anymore. Respectively, there's not that much supply coming into the market, pushing us significantly lower and below the EMA 50 here. And um, with that in mind, now let's switch to the hourly chart. You can see here, that we found some um, resistance in this region for quite some time. So yesterday, but also here, um, um, already on uh, last week was last week. Let me just let me just have a look here. Is it last week, 24th? Let me just see. Yeah, it was last week. No, it was Monday. I'm sorry. No, it's Monday. Sure, it's Monday here, and then it was the 20, 21st. Yeah. Um, and we found resistance there. So this is the region around the current weekly highs. So potentially some market, participants, some market participants may have this region here on the agenda. And um, now the thing is, uh, yesterday's push lower here, this, this order book imbalance, is in my opinion a sign that currently, also probably due to the uncertainty among this G20 summit, um, the order book is quite thin when, when looking, or in, in general, it's, it's not really... Um, um, it's, it's, it's not very liquid, the current market environment. And with that in mind, and due to the significance of this region, I think if we make it above 350, that could be um, the, uh, yeah, that could be the, the, the initial trigger for a quite bullish weekly close. And so far, it's very interesting to see markets really um, building this kind of resistance line on the upside, but the supply not being capable of pushing markets significantly lower. That's usually a sign that, there will be at least an attempt to break this region. And um, the risk reward probably is also quite quite attractive, let's say. And uh, in my opinion, um, if we can sustain, we make it above that level, the weekly close, again, is quite bullish for the DAX potentially. And first target on the upside can be found around 450, the current yearly highs. Um, and sure, it depends somehow on what US um, equity markets will deliver. But so far, we have the feeling that there has not been any escalation um, during the talks between Trump um, and and uh, um, other countries, which are, which are probably um, of interest in regards to tariffs, let's say, or where we should expect tariffs to rather sooner or later hit um, uh, in not the newswire, but the Twitter feed from, from Donald Trump. 
what do I mean by that? Let me just have a look here at the Twitter feed. So this is the economic calendar on the website from Admiral Markets, by the way. You can find it yourself at admiralmarkets.com. You click then on Analytics Forex Calendar, and there you can um, uh, individualize the calendar um, which whatever country you like, um, um, the time frame here, the language. So feel free to, to check it out yourself. It's really, really nice, in fact, and, and, and um, um, very, um, yeah, I, I think that the English word for this is handy, I think, and yeah. So however, so, um, but we want to have a look here at the Twitter feed, and in this case, uh, that's a retweet from my end, in this case, it's um, showing the schedule from Trump in uh, in uh, Japan at the G20 summit. It's from yesterday already. And the times you can see here are uh, um, Japanese time. So, which means it's uh, usually, and there you can see it, um, this talk here uh, between Xi Jinping tomorrow there, and uh, Trump is taking place at 11.30 a.m. tomorrow, uh, Saturday. But in our case, it's uh, um, overnight. It's taking place overnight. So it's from Friday to Saturday, respectively, in the very, very, very early hours of, of, of Saturday. So it won't affect the markets today, but potentially it will over um, it will over over the weekend. Then. And uh, we, we can probably already paint the clear picture of what to expect then. Um, still, so far, especially when looking at the current drift higher um, in the uh, in the in the um, uh, in the equity markets, especially in European equity markets, and on the other hand, looking at the current pressure US dollar is facing. So it's not significant, but you can see that Euro is, for example, bid against the US dollar. Same is true for JP, JPY. So JPY is bid against the US dollar while equities are trading higher, which is usually a first sign of market participants probably seeing some kind of um, um, diminishing tension, let's say, uh, and, and uh, not really seeing um, any any signs of, of another trade war escalation, which usually is countered by the countries which are hit by those tariffs, then in a way that they start to devalue their currency against the US dollar. So this is probably a first sign that there's also not really um, um, fears of an escalation between uh, uh, Xi and, and, and Trump tomorrow in their talks. And on top of that, you have to see it's 11.30 till here, the next meeting takes place with Erdogan, the uh, Turkey, Turkish prime minister. It's one and a half hour. So you really can't expect the big things to happen here. And uh, that means nothing more than the most likely outcome is probably that they will somehow announce, yes, trade negotiation, trade talks will resume. Um, we'll meet here wherever. Um, and and, and uh, Chinese uh, negotiators and, and U.S. negotiators will sit together again, and then we'll just see whether it, it, there will some there, there's any progress made or not. But at least at, initially, it's it's likely that here um, no further escalation is happening within the next weeks, let's say, and this is potentially bullish in my opinion for for equity markets. And um, now let's come back here also to to talk. Um, he had with the German Chancellor Merkel. Um, and this is, this is noteworthy because we remember when Mario Draghi last week before the um, uh, Fed decision on Wednesday, Draghi in Sintra uh, communicated um, that there is uh, further monetary policy steps uh, being made very likely that's very likely that they that they will somehow try to uh, um, 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 counter any negative effects um, um, on the on the European economy based on a too high currency for example respectively trying to counter any negative signs from the economic um, developments especially in Germany for example and market participants did something out of that which which comes natural they expect the ECB to cut rates further so we are already at at um, zero so that means market participants are obviously expecting the ECB to cut rates into the negative territory then um, and Trump's reaction was very aggressive, in fact, and, and he really targeted um, um, those comments from, from Draghi, mentioning how unfair it is that uh, these comments were made, that the US dollar um, gained that day against the euro. Still, it didn't gain that much, so we only saw a short drop below 112 and completely reversed this drop the day after when the Fed came out very dovish um, um, herself on, on last Wednesday. So. To say, or to put it differently, I think Trump um, 
no, not Trump, Draghi. Draghi didn't um, uh, or did expect Jay Powell slash the Fed to come out very dovish and try to somehow anticipate that by coming out very dovish himself and counter potential aggressive um, gains in the euro against the US dollar. And um, that said, it, it became obvious that uh, Trump is very likely to probably attack Europe rather sooner than later, especially Germany um, and, and their automobile sector. Uh, and today, the meeting here between um, Merkel and him showed that there was no further signs of, of um, 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 escalation happening. And um, he talked about Merkel as a, as a great person um, and yeah, was, was really nice. I mean, it's Donald Trump and everyone is a nice person. Um, remember the talks, uh, respectively, the calls uh, um, 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 which were made here when he was, when he was in, in Great Britain and, and talking about the Queen and, and talking about uh, Prince Charles, for example, the whale. You, you probably have seen it. It's not the Prince of Wales, but it's the it's whale with an H in it. Uh, that, that, was, that was a typo. And, and he, he deleted it shortly after. Nevertheless, it was a big joke um, 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 on, on social media. But still, um, the thing is, it, it showed very interestingly that um, his focus currently is somewhere else. And he um, mentioned this in, a, in an interview um, where he said he's currently um, 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 watching the developments around the Democrats here, uh, um, around the upcoming um, elections in 2020, and uh, which um, candidate would most likely make it into the race against him. Um, and there was now this discussion around the healthcare uh, sector, um, 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 sector, and uh, there was right at the time, shortly before he met with Merkel, that's what was said, um, there was this, this point made where um, they were talking about giving 100% um, um, uh, healthcare um, respectively, health insurance to um, illegal immigrants, which is also a big topic, as you remember, with the wall to Mexico and all this. So, and uh, it, obviously his focus is a different one. And also on top of that, there was um, here a talk with India um, where it was said that uh, he also um, um, is very skeptical about their policies, also in regards to tariffs and their um, upcoming um, um, strength and dynamic they're taking on from an economic perspective. And obviously, he probably does not want to, um, to find himself uh, in too many different spots at the same time in regards to trade. So it's still no solution with China. You um, are now attacking India and somehow you probably want to avoid a direct confrontation and escalation with Europe. And this is something which probably can also be seen then in the developments we currently see in the markets. Um, so with this, all, with all this in mind, that it's very important to, to get this, this big picture, I think, um, chances are high that there won't be such an escalation um, overnight than tonight. And, and Chances are high that there will be um, at least a communication which is most likely um, pushing then equities up to the current yearly highs around 12,450. And if we start to anticipate that in a thin market environment right now, a bullish breakout can easily occur today in the DAX. Um, and that could probably is, is um, about to happen and, and we should closely, really closely watch um, the current developments here. So probably um, a heavier breakout is about to, to happen. Um, yeah, if we can target, in fact, 12,450 points, you can also see here on the upside uh, potential gains um, up to 12,600 points, respectively here, 12,900, 850 to 900 points become also an option in the days to come, especially in my opinion, if in the upcoming week of trading, the um, economic indicators, we can close this by the way, the economic indicators here from the US um, surprise on the upside. So why do I say that? Well, uh, after last week, we can definitely or should definitely affect, um, 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 no, expect the Fed to uh, be very dovish. And um, as you can see here in the Fed watch tool, we made this a topic already. We'll mention this again um, um, in a few seconds when, when, when referring to the comments from uh, James Bullard made on Tuesday. But we can clearly see here the current target raise is 225 to 250 basis points. And this is the um, likelihood probability of um, uh, how likely market participants consider the Fed to act at the next meeting. And they see a cut 
by 100%. In fact, only three out of four. There's some market participants also here seeing two rate cuts happening or uh, rate cut by 50 basis points, even though James Bullard um, here mentioned that he considers a 50 basis point cut um, overdone. So um, Bullard says that this is the article from Bloomberg, says quarter point cut is enough for insurance. What is he talking about here? Insurance, um, the Fed trying to counter any negative impact um, the, econom the US, economy, US economy could face Bay or resulting out of a trade war escalation, for example, a too strong U.S. dollar. Even though main focus here is most likely on the on the trade war, um, and so with this comment, in fact, that was a hawkish comment from uh, from 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 uh, Bullard. Hawkish in regards to a, to a rate cut is a probably a difficult word, but nevertheless, I think you get what I'm talking about. Um, so it's compared to what markets were expecting before he made these comments, it's hawkish. Because when looking here at the um, uh, probabilities, you could have seen that a 50 points basis um, uh, um, a 50 basis point rate cut was um, priced in by nearly 40%. So it was nearly a 50-50 deal, a slight tendency that there will only be a 25 basis point cut, but still there were several market participants probably looking a little um, to the G20 summit and the uncertainty around it that the Fed is really capable of cutting um, the um, 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 uh, the interest rate level by 50 basis points. So this drop now is most likely also one of the reasons why the US dollar could stabilize a little respectively. For example, the very extended mode in, in gold on the upside um, uh, consolidated here. But still, it also shows um, when such a rhetoric is used, um, so insurance cut, for example, or um, it's uh, 50 basis points would be overdone. I mean, James Bullard is known to be a dove, a real, um, 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 a real extreme dove, if you want, in the uh, um, bet board of, of Fed members. Um, still, it's it's uh, showing that there is discussions happening around this, and the very very um, um, dovish Fed has to be expected over the next months. Then, so if you go up to December, for example, so there's only four meetings um, taking place, you can clearly spot that currently the market is um, still expecting with um, way over 50%, so in fact 60% here, three rate cuts minimum um, here, even though now four cuts, uh, the, the, the likelihood dropped due to those comments made by, by, um, by Bullard. But this perfectly illustrates um, and clearly illustrates that whatever happens next week, um, the Fed will be very dovish in the upcoming six months. That said, it means nothing more than any good data set now is a positive sign because it happens into an environment in which uh, the Fed still should be considered come out dovish and equity friendly with cutting rates and a very dovish rhetoric on top of um, or in addition to a very um, um, a dovish ECB, for example. So this is a combination where I say, where I'd, I'd say, I, I think that any positive data set coming out now next week, so ASM manufacturing not coming out at 51.5, probably 52, or similar to the to the month before, um, or also the non-manufacturing data set, or also here the non-farm payrolls. Any positive data set is potentially bullish for equity. So. Um, and this is especially true if, if there's no further escalation now on the G20 summit. Um, while on the other hand, we can also say that any positive data set here is probably resulting in some very interesting price action then in uh, yield sensitive, respectively US dollar sensitive assets, like for example, gold. You can see here that we squeezed as high as 1,440 US dollar per ounce. Um, you probably also remember that we made this region around 360 to 365 here, 1,360 to 1,365, um, a big topic over the last months, uh, weeks and months. Um, that here in this, in this uh, um, um, regard, a push above that level, a break higher here, is most likely resulting in a sharper squeeze on the upside, which in fact happened. And uh, it resulted not only in the squeeze on the upside, but we, we went as high as 1,440 USD. That was a uh, level last time seen in September 2013. Yes, I think so. Yeah, 1,440 was, was September 2013. The region here on the upside, 480, 490 was... Uh, 
March 2013. And um, it also resulted here in the RSI 14 to push to the highest levels seen last time in uh, in uh, 2016, or was before the election of Donald Trump back then. Um, and usually this is a sign that here the market is probably a little very extended on the upside and it, it seems likely that there will be a correction um, ahead of us or respectively risk reward ratio for long engagements is not very attractive anymore. Um, still, uh, the, the trigger then, which was delivered, was by was by James Bullard with this with these comments, and it it, it resulted here that was um, um, Tuesday. It then resulted in this in this sharp push down towards 1,400 USD. Still, we didn't push below that level. And why do I mention that? Because any good and positive um, um, economic data set now coming from the US. And again, the economic docket is quite packed next week. Still, we have the bank holiday on uh, um, um, on. on on Thursday, even though markets are open, it's nevertheless short in trading hours. And that's also true for gold or precious metals in this case. Um, still, the thing is that any good positive data set is probably seeing uh, the US dollar gaining, at least short term, but the longer time frame for at least the next six months is definitely negative. So, which means any positive um, signs from the US economy or any positive data set being published will probably push gold a little lower, but it's a perfect opportunity, in my opinion at least, um, that, that we are about to see a, a chance to buy the dip then. Um, sure, we shouldn't really buy into any push on the downside here, but probably wait for the market to, to stabilize and start to build a structure of higher highs and higher lows. But I think in general, um, the overall outlook is is very positive for for gold the inversion of the yield curve for example pointing to a recession in the near term dropping yields very um um um, um dovish fat which should be expected all this is usually a very very positive sign for for gold and um any dip now is most likely very attractive for long engagements and um, these are in fact only stop over targets on the upside in my opinion 1440 respectively 480 490 my uh, projected target some of you probably recall that from this um, um, rising wedge formation here um, or ascending triangle probably we should call it um, is around 1,700 USD as a minimum target on the upside. So I'm not talking about an intraday target, sure, but a target which could be easily hit um, between 1,000, um, um, uh, 1,000, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> a target which could be hit within the next months, six to 12 months, not 1,000 months. Um, yeah, and uh, so that's it. And in fact, in, in regards to gold, so, uh, I, yeah, you probably have heard it between the lines. Um, I really hope for good economic data from the US since it does not change the overall picture, but most likely results in this extended mode to, to see um, a sharper correction and uh, leaving us then with a very attractive chance from a risk reward perspective um, to enter gold from the long side then, um, and then going for targets on the upside, which can be midterm, seen around 1,700 USD. Um, I guess that, that this is an interesting question. I guess um, they are the reef from Reuters and Bloomberg um, uh, um, 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 I am, um, analysts, which are which are uh, quoted here. So uh, usually it's it's a combination. Um, and uh, the, the question, by the way, sorry, the question was whose forecasts are posted in the economic calendar. So you can see here forecast, but still the, the question remains, okay, and whose forecast is it? And this is a fair question. Um, I think it's from Bloomberg, respectively Reuters, combination of both um, are probably, which are, which are um, then um, 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 published here. You can also see that, by the way, uh, by, let's go to a website which is very, very helpful for fundamental data. It's called tradingeconomics.com. Uh, I'd like to share the, the link here. It's all for free. And uh, what you can, for example, see, let's have a look at here, in this case, the countries. Click here on the United States. And then you can, let's have a look at today's data, personal spending, for example, month on month. Um, where do we find it? Probably below con consumer. And then you have personal spending here. 
and there you can see numbers will be published today at um, 12.30 p.m. GMT and there you can see the consensus of 0.4 and if you click here you can also see personal spending 0.4 so they're referring to the same numbers and these numbers are also derived here from analysts being quoted or, or being, being um, um, uh, asked here from uh, trading economics in this case. By the way, it's also very interesting to see that based on the latest developments, uh, the trading economics forecast is 0.2, um, which is also a sign that there's at least some market participants probably uh, expecting um, a weaker uh, reading, which means nothing more than a better than expected reading could also trigger bullishness in equities, respectively could trigger some bullishness in US dollar. I mean, personal spending is not such a, um, a big economic number like the NFPs or something, but still, it's something which could cause some, some uh, short-term volatility at least. Um, yeah, so that's it in regards to the, uh, to the gold price then. Let's have a look at the EURUSD, which has at least not yet seen um, uh, much changes over the last uh, seven days since our last weekly market outlook webinar. So still we can see that uh, EURUSD stabilizes above 113, significantly above 113. Um, and it's not due to Euro strength, but still or it's, it's more due to US dollar weakness. Um, and this is one of the main reasons I'd really like to be careful uh, when it comes to long engagements in, in the EURUSD still due to the weakness in the US dollar, I really don't want to um, uh, um, I don't want to, to short Euro USD here and I don't really see um, a drop down to 111. That's definitely something you should have in mind and probably still should have in mind um, since there's nearly every time potential uh, escalation in regards to trade and the new tweet from Trump and still the thing is that so far there's not many uh, things or indications pointing towards an escalation between Europe and uh, the US after the talks between Merkel and, and Trump. And with this in mind, I think um, we can say that uh, it, it's unlikely that there will be such a such an attack on Europe. And with this in mind, it seems very unlikely that this, this drop here, which definitely needs such a catalyst, um, um, such a drop lower is unlikely. And it's more, more likely that we'll continue with this current bullish momentum and uh, that we'll probably get to see at least, uh, not necessarily today, but probably then in the next week with the upcoming economic um, data from the US, uh, that we probably get to see the push towards 114. On the other hand, it's uh, the chance that there will be disappointing data. And this is also something probably worth noting here in regards to gold. Gold is very trend stable, which means even if the mode looks extended, if the data disappoints next week, US dollar weakness is probably um, hitting again because then um, these comments from Bullock will probably be countered. Uh, and, and this then means that we probably continue straight away with bullishness and the squeeze higher in gold, bringing us as high as 1,480, 490 USD as the next target. Um, same is true then for EURUSD, where 1,450, 115 um, comes into play and also where currently at least the long side should be favored. But again, not due to the euro strength, but due to US dollar weakness. Um, and Let's have a look at also here at the dollar JPY. I think a very interesting currency pair, very interesting, um, due to the uh, um, not only risk um, uh, connection, let's say, uh, so potential trade war escalation, all this is potential bullish trigger for JPY due to um, uh, market participants unwinding carry trades. But what I think is very important right now is the following, um, even if the data in the US disappoints, I, I'm sorry, no, um, 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 uh, surprises on the upside, other way around, um, next week, it's the same picture as in gold, only for the short side. So, because any positive sign could probably see short-term extension of the correction in, in the US dollar, respectively see short-term bullish reaction in US yields, but this, do, do not, change the overall picture, which is very bearish for the US dollar and, and, and for, for yields. And what's very interesting right now is the following. Um, I prepared something here on the website's bar chart. So first of all, here's uh, US Treasury yields. You can see the stabilization around 2% over the last day. So probably this is also one of the reasons why gold, for example, is stabilizing um, at an elevated level and uh, 
let's just see. You can see here we didn't see a, a, a further push lower, but it's uh, right now stabilizing. Nevertheless, the thing is, and this is very interesting, I probably, some might probably think, okay, but what about now seeing a sharper corrective move on the upside? I think that's fair from a, from a technical perspective, but from a fundamental perspective, as already shown, but also from a sentiment perspective, that's not very likely, but I think we have a fair chance to continue significantly lower. Why do I say that? Look at the... Um, Commitment of Traders report here, uh, um, uh, which is published every week. So this data is from last week, Tuesday, was before the Fed. So we definitely have to wait how things developed here. But still, I think um, it's it's very interesting to see also based on the current developments in yields that this, this positioning has probably not changed that much and dramatically. So in green, in this line here, you see the large speculators. And the large speculators are currently... You, uh, and this is surprising. Usually, you expect them to to be trend followers. You see that since September, October last year, from around 118, uh, when when here these lows were hit in, in, in T note futures, there has been a really significant rally on the upside, bringing us as high as 127 in 10-year T note futures. And uh, in fact, the whole time there has been a net short positioning, which means, um, by the way, there's a, a negative correlation, which means if yields drop, um, or if you're betting on, on, on dropping yields, you're usually long T notes, respectively, if you bet on yields to rise, you're usually short T note future. So put it differently, large speculators are currently short T note futures. So, and this is surprising, especially given the fact um, what the Fed delivered and given the, the, the extreme dovishness in her remarks over the last days. So why, the question is, why are large speculators short and how long will they remain short? In, in fact, you have to see here, we are, we are nearly short um, 50,000 contracts, which is quite enormous um, um, given the fact that, that the, the, um, these extremes here in September, October last year, um, here had something like, Minus seventy-five thousand or so. By the way, I'm sorry, I, I missed one one zero. He's not. It's five hundred thousand. So it's around um, um, seven hundred fifty thousand contracts. Um, they were net short, uh, and now they're currently around five hundred thousand contracts net short. So this is a, a reduction, yes, but still, it's not such an extreme or, or significant reduction as you may have expected it. Why do I mention it? Well, it could be. Especially if we if we are going above this level here, the highs from 2017 uh, that was also made in September. If we break above 128, um, there is probably um, a short squeeze hitting, respectively. In this case, it's a, it's a, it's a long squeeze, short squeeze in yields, which means if these market participants are then buying back futures, it could also trigger further gains here. In the Tino future, which means known the positive correlation between U.S. yields and dollar JPY, which means if yields are about to drop sharply, then dollar JPY should be expected to drop sharply too. And the main target on the downside can be then found around 105. So this is a very very interesting currency pair and also very interesting development in the yield market, which is uh, something you should definitely closely watch and which could be of high interest then. Um, and it, so far, known the fact that the JPY is a carry trade funding a currency, uh, we, we also know that any risk of hitting the markets and therefore the escalation between the US and Iran, for example, uh, in, the, in the Middle East, this is also a topic, big topic, could definitely trigger such a squeeze and, and should be carefully watched and, and could see, we could definitely see, based on that development here, some, some uh, potential turmoils in, uh, in the yield markets then. So, and... Um, now, finally, let's close the webinar with this pattern I mentioned at the beginning, Euro Polish Slotty. So again, and I haven't traded it before, but nevertheless, um, over the last 17 years, it's also very, by the way, it's a very um, involatile currency pair, but still very interesting to see here, 17 years, uh, 14 out of these 17 years. So going back till, um, till uh, um, 2002, between June 28th today and July 4th, so next week on tu Thursday, sorry, um, here Euro Polish Slotty saw an average drop of 49 pips um, in 14 years. So that results then in a hit rate of 
82%, and um, only saw an average gain if, if we draw, uh, if we put pushed higher of 36 pips. So uh, this is um, average, by the way, I'm sorry, the max, I, I brought this, uh, sorry. Average loss was 23 pips. So meaning if your euro Polish lot is short and the average gain during this time span was 23 pips with a max loss of 33 um, at the end of this period and a max drawdown of 36. But still, this is below the average uh, gain, respect of the average drop of the currency pattern, which makes this um, um, pattern probably even more interesting. And um, yeah, the idea of how to trade this can be can be found here in this article, which was already published, by the way. Um, I, I call it Euro Polish Slotty Seasonal. Um, it was already published on Wednesday, so you usually find these informations in uh, over the website here. And um, again, before we now start to dig into the macroeconomic uh, drivers of Euro. This is not a big deal. We already did this, but nevertheless, a Polish lottery, I'd, I'd like to step back from here and focus only on the technical side of the seasonal pattern. And uh, yeah, let's just see whether it plays out or not. So next week on Friday, we'll see whether it played out or not. Um, it did an 82% of the last uh, um, 17 years, so 14 um, times. And let's see if it works out again. <laughs> and that's it for my end. So I wish you uh, a nice weekend. I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Um, if there's anything um, I can do for you, ask your questions, send them over to Admiral, they will forward to me. Ask the question directly below the recording of the webinar, which will be published over the weekend. Um, so Saturday, Sunday, if you sub subscribe to the uh, um, uh, channel, the, the YouTube channel from Admiral Markets, um, you will, you will um, I'm notified that there will be such a um, 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 video uploaded and um, ask your questions there. I definitely look forward to it and I'd be more than happy to, to answer them. And um, yeah, that's it for my end. So have a nice weekend. All the best from Berlin, Germany. Have a nice weekend. Enjoy yourself. Talk to you next week again in the Week of Market Auto webinar. I look forward to it. See you and bye-bye.